There was a lot of points in my life where I should have gotten sober, where there were instances and there were things that happened like where I got really drunk and I had huge regrets. And it was, you know, New Year's Eve and I like freaked out on people and had a, you know, a panic attack because I just wanted to party and they wanted to like have a chill wine night and, you know, personality clashes with a lot of that. And so I feel like there was those kinds of like things happening and those weren't the milestones that, like, that I finally got sober with. Like I, I finally like, I just got sick of all the regrets that compiled really. And like normally it's like people get a DUI or there's like a moment that happens. But literally like I woke up and I was so sick of like the person that I was. Cause knowing the person that I am, it was never the person I was when I was drunk. Mm -hmm. And so like, it was like really hard to be like, okay, like what person am I truly? Like, who am I really? Like, what does make me mad? What makes me insecure? What makes me feel lonely? What makes me feel vulnerable? Because you mask so much of that with alcohol. I'm like trying to party and like escape that situation. Hello, I'm Isaac, founder of I Am Clinic, a psychotherapy practice in Denver, Colorado, and co-host of Queer Relationships. Thanks for listening in today. In this episode, my guest and I talk about the challenges of alcoholism and the grief he experiences as a sober person in the queer community. Our journey together paints a picture of an innocent little boy hunting for love, one whose hopes were thwarted by paralyzing rejection. But most of all, our journey takes us on an exploration of what it means to be a queer person who is deeply, deeply rooted in their authenticity. You'll find his strength encouraging and his passion for love and life inspiring. It can be difficult to allow oneself to be as vulnerable as my guest, and I want to say thank you to him for his openness, his story of strength, self-betrayal, and the courage to confront his deepest fears has left me with tears in my eyes and warmth in my heart. Let's take a listen. Tell me when you first knew that you were gay. Oh dear God. The first time I knew I was gay was when my mom got a, like a card in the mail that was a guy in a Speedo on the front of the card. He was laying in a lawn chair and you opened it up and there was a small napkin and it just said, here's a napkin to catch the drool. Oh and my mom got it. We laughed. Like, you know, she went to go put it in the garbage and I took it out of the garbage and I put it under a chair in the living room and would lift up the cushion, like the, like the cushion of the chair and I would stare at it. And like, that was kind of like the first like real sign of like, mm -hmm. I loved boys. And then of course it went to like the Jonathan Taylor Thomas phase, like a little bit after that, where oh, I was just Jesus. like, exactly. And I like kissed his face and I was like, I think I want to kiss boys. Like it was a paper, like from one of those teen pop magazines uh -huh. and I like posted it. And that's when I knew I was like, I want to kiss boys. Like that was like, it was in my room. And I like sneakily just kind of like kissed it. And I was like, that's, that's when, you know, uh -huh. and I tried to have like the Victoria's secret wall of all the hot girls, but really I was just like, JTT. <laughs> where I was really, yeah. No amount of posters could compete with JTT. Yeah, no, yeah. totally. But I remember just being like, I want to kiss it. It's oh. like, it just, it was so innocent, but so cute. <laughs> yeah. That's when I knew I was gay for mm -hmm. sure. I think was that moment. Did it feel good from the very beginning to know that you wanted to kiss boys? Um, I mean, yeah, like there was always, yeah, I mean, it always felt okay to me. Like it always was like what was natural. Like it never was a question. Like mm -hmm. it never really like bothered me that it was boys. It never like, I was never afflicted by it. Like I knew that it caused affliction. Mm -hmm. Like can you deny it? And like, you know, like being made fun of was painful, but it never bothered me to be gay. Like I always kind of was like, boys are cool. Like mm -hmm. I always knew that I like boys and like, I never felt like I wanted to be an, like another gender in loving boys. I just loved boys mm -hmm. as a boy. Like that was probably, there was like that confliction, I think more than anything, but it never, like I always just loved boys. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like, it was like, they're cute. They're mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. And my brother always had hot friends. So it was like, I was always around other boys. That I think <laughs> had. So like, mm -hmm. you know, and they were all kind of queer. So it felt really good. Like they were BMXers. So they wore like tight pants and they went thrift shopping and they wore girl shirts and like, oh, that's they cool. had such a queerness to them. Anyways, it was like mm -hmm. almost a mind fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it was yeah, silly. Sure. So yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. What kind of messages did you get as a queer kiddo from culture? Um, I, you know, it was, I, I was, when I was growing up, it was like, Will and Grace was kind of a big deal. And like Queer Eye for the Strike, I was like finally coming out when I was like in my teens. Mm -hmm. And it was like the first go around of Queer Eye. 
And um, I kind of actually came out because of one of them. So the fact that they were starting to show up uh, like around me and in media kind of like was really important and kind of exciting because there was no denying that I was gay. Like I had dolls. I played with dolls. And like my mom went through a phase where she threw out all my dolls in hopes of like making me less gay. And that was like traumatizing and terrible. And I searched the whole house and I never found them. Um, and so I feel like, you know, having Queer Eye kind of as like a, a base like that was one of those things that let me know that it was real and it existed and it was not outside of the realm of acceptance because it was on television. Mm -hmm. So seeing it on TV was really, really crucial, um, I think, honestly. And so when I went to Disney World with one of my aunts, one of the Queer Eye guys was there. And I ran across the parade and oh. I was like, you're K. It was K. And then he did hair. And I thought he was like the hottest. He was, did hair. He was so unique. He was beautiful. And he looked like a little quirky, but still was really hot. And so I like ran over there and I like looked at him and I just like started crying. And I was like, you're gay. I'm gay. Like, this is crazy. Oh. And yeah, and, like the Disney people like took our picture. And like, I, and my aunt was just like, what the hell did I just witness? And like, you know, she's like, I'm not going to tell your mom, you know, tell her whenever you want. And mm -hmm. so she was kind of the first person that I came out to in that regards and like was really honest with her because like that was a real I, I, icon identity that I really identified with and was so grateful for like, like a presence. Mm -hmm. So queerness kind of did have a presence in like in the, in the real world, but not in a way that was like accepted, but like. You know, you tell my mom I had an issue with it, but you couldn't deny my gayness. Mm -hmm. You mentioned his aesthetic. Do you feel like having an aesthetic has been an important piece for your identity? It's always something I've had. Like, even when I was little, it was like I was dressing Barbies. I was dressing me like I would wrap a towel around my body in 1,500 different ways. Like, I was like, why don't girls wear towels to school? Like, how come they don't just, like, wear it like this and do that? And, like, I have always loved material and fabrics and, like, just the capability of things. Because, like, I think kind of as a queer youth, it's like you're already presenting such a weird person. Like, you're already flamboyant. You're already weird. You're already clocked. You're already red. People are like, he's gay before you even know that you're gay. So you're always told something. And so, like, it's weird that flamboyancy was so inherent in me. So it's like when I do get dressed and when I do get ready, it's like I'm already going to be called out for being gay anyway. So I might as well embrace what I really want, what I truly love. And again, I had the influence of my brother's friends that were wearing what they wanted and being who they kind of were. But like, it, you know, it was also like attention seeking behavior because they were like badasses and they wore tight clothes. And like, it was such a cool inspiration to see people be authentic, you know, even though they're all wearing the same thing, it was still like, you know, something that everyone else wasn't doing. Yeah. And so because I witnessed that growing up, I was like every Friday to school, I just wear something like loud and proud and funky. And I got other people on Fridays to just dress flamboyant because it was just like one of those things. And I've always found that like, I just, I thrive when my, when my inner personality is on my outside, mm -hmm. like it's a conversation starter. It's interesting. It's one of those things that like almost deflects from the gayness. Cause it's like, no matter what people are going to question or be curious or like, you know, when you, project really homosexual anyways it's like cargo shorts don't make you more masculine like mm -hmm. and some people really feel that way and so i kind of was like if i'm gonna be called out i'm gonna be bullied i'm gonna do everything that i wanted to that's inherently me and i have to like you know you deal with a lot of kickback and pushback but at the same time it's like i've always offered up my genuine true self and it's kind of just like cool like i clearly don't care if you call me a faggot like i'm wearing mm -hmm. my heart on my sleeve i'm wearing me it's like love it or hate it like you can't call me a faggot if I present as a faggot, basically. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I get it. I know. Like, the role became very reversed in that regards because I just didn't care, you know? It's almost like you own it, though. Like, I think there's many queer people out there who feel like being blasted or being clocked is such a heavy weight and they try to avoid it. What is it about you that loves it almost sounds like you um are so maybe more comfortable there yeah i mean like i said when when people tell you you're gay before you even know it it's like you just kind of like you understand it and i just feel like you know when you have a passion for something you have to go forth with it and clothing and aesthetic is my passion like you know I, I'm sitting here for an audio interview, even though I'm wearing full face. I have on eye makeup. I have on my look. I just, even when I'm in my own house, I have something fabulous on. I have a house coat. I have like a, like a gown that I think is important. Or I make, when I travel on an airplane, I wear like a travel gown. That's just a long t-shirt dress. Like presenting my best self is always very, very important to me because it's, it's something a lot of people almost can't do. And the fact that it has been really just inherent to me is one of those things I'm really grateful for and I love to express. So it's kind of hard because I, I don't know if people are afraid of being authentic or just have no idea how. Mm -hmm. Like, 
there's so many people like go to their house and they're like, I love this shirt, but I could never wear it. And I'm like, does it have armholes? Like you bought it, just put it on your body. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a face tattoo. It's not anything permanent. It's so temporary. And that's how I've always viewed clothing. It's like just such a temporary thing Mm -hmm. that it's just like, it it doesn't bother me that like, you know, I want it to be expressive and I want it to be true and I want it to be like who I am expressively. So I get really confused because I try to understand why people don't express themselves or why they get so mad when someone else does. Mm -hmm. Like I was asked a long time ago, like when you get dressed, what do you think in the morning? And I'm always like, Will I inspire you or will I piss you off? Because mm. there's always that type of spectrum for it. Because in my mind, it's like, I'm just being true to who I am. But to other people, it's like enraging or weird or I'm being like, you know, flashy or flamboyant. But again, it doesn't matter if I was in cargo shorts or anything else. So I guess for other people, I just, I don't know. I guess I just am lucky enough to know what I love and what I like and just trust that like, it's fun. And my look changes every day. And mm. that's kind of what I also love is that like, I can dress like a boy as like, you know, in camouflage and try to decoy myself. Like I, if I want to get laid, I have this one camo shirt that I wear with dark denim jeans and I wear with a boot because it presents like farmer boy hillbilly and boys that are gay. Love that. So like, but then if you look on my Instagram, it's me and lashes and makeup and like, you know, being really queer, but like, you know, you have to play to your audience sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's what's tricky. And I don't know if people realize that like, presenting your true authentic self is a great armor because that brings confidence and that brings person and like clothing to me is my armor of confidence. Like it just, it just adds to my person, I guess. It almost sounds like not having that clothing is a betrayal to you. Yeah. When I'm not in what I like, I feel, I feel uncomfortable. I feel disingenuous. I feel like even when I work, I have to wear, if I have to wear a uniform, I'm wearing way more eye makeup. If I have to wear something that I'm not comfortable with, I'm going to try to like make it my own thing. I've like tailored shirts differently that are work shirts. I've added fringe to shirts that shouldn't have, you know what I mean? I've, I've always kind of, I've rolled up the sleeves on t-shirts to make them more fitted. I've done everything, you know, in my power to at least stand out in, in a uniform too, even like it's, it just doesn't, I have to have my flair. I have my jewelry. I have my things on. In this way, you're very true to yourself. How do you feel like you betrayed yourself? Oh, God. Um, I mean, I dated someone who didn't like that I was flamboyant. So I dumbed down my style and my personality when we went places together, which was one of those things like I, you know, I would put on a front around his people to blend in as a couple. And that was really betraying to myself and to circumstance and to everything because it was like he wanted me to be his boyfriend, but then his friend in public. So I'd like present this very interesting character of like, you know, I put on button ups and different pants and like I had a closet at his house. That was not the closet at my house. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that was really intense, but it was one of those things where it's like, I wanted to appease him so much that I sacrificed some of myself in doing that. So like, you know, it was, that was probably the, the one like in those years of my life, mind you, it's not like, it wasn't the one time, it was the one phase onto which, like, you know, I, reg- I, I regret doing it, but at the same time, it's like, I just wanted to not make him uncomfortable. Like, mm-hmm. I can, you know, not have to, I, I can morph into that, like, for his comfort. It was more like that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that I was being wildly disingenuous, but, like, I definitely changed my aesthetic and who I was for that circumstance. So maybe I do regret that. A yeah. hundred percent. <laughs> At the clinic, we call it a teta where in some way we're taking care of other people's emotions by shutting ours down, by being smaller, by hiding or filtering. Who we are. <laughs> yep. and so, Can relate. Uh-huh. Can relate. And so this was a season of ta-da, kind of just living there. Yeah. 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 What do you feel like has been one of your biggest challenges I don't know. I, my biggest challenge, I just, I'm in it right now. I get it. Wrong. <laughs> I'm in it. Like I'm in it right now. I am, um, I guess, I think, I mean, I'm probably getting sober, but like just being like, that's, it's so hard. Like, I don't know. I, this, that's the, such a hard question. I'm probably getting sober, like probably literally like doing this and like getting, getting to where like I have to be true to myself, but that, that getting sober has caused a lot of affliction in my brain. Cause it's like, Number one, can I do it? So that problem is still ever changing every day. Mm -hmm. Two, it's like, it's caused me to be so much more aware of myself and my surrounding and like get grounded, which is also like crazy. So like, it's one of those things where like, I think this may be like the biggest challenge, but also the greatest thing. Like it's not even a challenge right now. 
it's just prompting so much change that I can't tell like what, what is what, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, it sounds like getting sober is an emotional, like mind versus matter kind of challenge. Yeah. I mean, I, it's really weird. There was a lot of points in my life where I should have gotten sober, where there were instances and there were things that happened, like where I got really drunk and I had huge regrets and it was, you know, New Year's Eve and I like freaked out on people and had a, you know, a panic attack because I just wanted to party and they wanted to like have a chill wine night and, you know, personality clashes with a lot of that. And so I feel like there was those kinds of like things happening and those weren't the milestones that, like, that I finally got sober with. Like I, I finally like, I just got sick of all the regrets that compiled really. And like, normally it's like people get a DUI or there's like a moment that happens, but literally like I woke up and I was so sick of like the person that I was because knowing the person that I am, it was never the person I was when I was drunk. Mm. And so like, it was like really hard to be like, okay, like what person am I truly? Like, who am I really? Like, what does make me mad? What makes me insecure? What makes me feel lonely? What makes me feel vulnerable? Because you mask so much of that with alcohol and like trying to party and like escape that situation because like as bold as a person as I am it's like I've I'm really intimidating to a lot of people or at least I like to think I am but I was like really am I just a drunk fucking asshole and people hate me or am I unapproachable or I'm always really approachable until I'm too drunk and then I'm an arrogant fucker who like wants to you know just say some shit because people I think judge me or I judge them or like you really have to like debate where your emotions are coming from because when I'm drunk I have a lot more emotions that are like um I have a lot more trauma when I'm drunk. I have a lot more things that really like hit me harder. Like, you know, I feel so much lonelier when I'm drunk when really it's like I wasn't taking care of myself. And I was in these like miserable spots that I didn't know how to change because I was only worried about getting drunk or partying. And finally that really clicked one day that like maybe if I just get sober, things will like come together. Mm-hmm. And like it was, it was, it was really weird. It was just like this right timing for me like to actually do it and put in the work where like I woke up and I was like this is what I'm doing today this is like this is I'm like like not in like some weird like journal about I feel so bad I slap Sarah in the face I'm an asshole kind of thing where like but I was like no like I need to see who I am I need to get to the root of me I need to see what this is because like I was having such ebbs and flows of like vulnerability and being mad at my mom for not like being near me or being like my brother was like weird things i was just i was i was acting out towards everyone i even loved because i felt like no one cared about me Mm. and i was like maybe i don't care about me Mm. like here's what i think i finally realized like the way i was like lashing out at everyone like anyone in a relationship i hated anyone who like you know had things i didn't have i hated i could just see like myself getting so bitter and have malice towards people that had things because like i was crumbling on the inside and i finally i was like if i want to do things i need to do things for me and like get to that and realize that and like the only way I think I could do it was just by getting sober because I was causing myself so much harm and getting drunk. <laughs> like I really was. <laughs> it was crazy. It almost sounds like there was like this cluster of content covered by this seal and alcohol when poured on that seal dissolved it so all of this stuff could come up. And I, yeah, I mean, and I would harbor things for years and get drunk and have like explosions. And like, if I'm being honest, like there may have been a little cocaine and a little bit of booze, <laughs> like in the same way. And those two things are crazy because like you kind of black out, but then you're pushed by the cocaine in this weird way to like, you know, your brain is still there and you're still, you know, in it, but like your mind isn't like you're blacked out, but you're kind of like feeling all these ways. And like, I would go on tangents and not remember anything the next day. And people are like, you're crazy. And like, you know, and you kind of, start to realize that and then you just like say that you don't care so you do it even more as if like you're like like you don't care that you've you know burned the village like you just don't care and like then that creates this whole whirlwind of things and so like even now it's like i don't know who i've upset or who i've hurt or what my reputation is like when i'm that person who i don't know like it's really that was like the hardest thing is realizing that my reputation was of someone i don't even know like you know like truthfully it's just this angry bitter malice person because people meet me I have this great outfit on I'm really fun I have all this flair and then you get me drunk and I'm a fucking arrogant piece of shit like rude person who like hurts people who like wants to cut you down because sometimes it's hard when you have gay friends because you're just the queerest gayest thing and they're confused by that or like you know it, it, the, you know you're too gay or like you know you don't get love because you present like in a, in a, in a gay way so that's not 
what's the word when like coveted by other gay men. They want straight men. They want masculine men. So Denver has this really weird thing where there's not much queerness in our community. Like there's not a lot of like gays who are fashion forward and, you know, thought provoking and have like city flair. You go to New York, they're everywhere. San Francisco, everywhere. Chicago, you know, people present more of them their, their, themselves. So in Denver, I stick out like a sore thumb, which was always a point of awesomeness and conversation. But now it's a point of like, it, it just makes me an oddity. And it, this city's gotten a little bit more like white and a little more Wisconsin and a little more rural where like, instead of progressing in a city way, there's even more kind of like this other kind of way of people view me so weird. I'm such a spectacle. And it's like, don't I live in a city? So you go out, you know, with the gays and you're too gay and you go out with the straights and then like you become the token gay. And then you can feel the energy of the straight people around you who are like, that guy's gay. Like, that's just too much. I can't handle that. Like, what's that about? So then you drink because you feel ostracized in both environments. And then you become kind of like this, you know, stereotype of like a gay, sassy asshole. Like, I just it, it explodes. Like, it feels weird because you really don't feel comfortable in either space. Like, because, you know, you're, you're, you're looking, especially me, I guess, I was just really looking for like love and compassionate and like, I always say that I wanted someone to decompress with. And I couldn't find that in any environment. I was like, maybe if I go to a straight bar, I'll find someone who acts straight but wants like a gay boy because like they're closeted or there's this, which I often find myself in those relationships with people who are very closeted because I'm so open, which is like a terrible juxtaposition. But like, you know, since I've stopped doing that and like stopped, stopped looking for that though, I've like really like, I've come to be so grateful for like myself and like my person and like looking for that now that it's like, you know, I realized why I was making all those poor choices and becoming that person and had those behaviors. I was just like looking for love and validation because I did, I didn't think I had it anywhere else, you know? And I was really like burning a lot of bridges because I felt so alone and so lonely because I, I just, I don't know. It was, it was really, really tough because I'm not going to lose myself. And I really feel like if I wore that straight shirt and I wore those straight jeans, I could blend in or fit in or get what I was looking for and acting a way that I didn't want to. And so it, it, it's really hard because it's such a such a weird thing to feel authentic, but also be like an oddity in your own community. And then even outside of your community, you become a spectacle. And that's even weirder because then you have to like play it into that spectacle or play it up or like, you know, you just feel ostracized, even though you're being authentic. Like if one more person took a video of me just on the dance floor because they were like, that guy's fucking in the sequence having too much fun. It's like, you can't tell if they're making fun of you. Like, then that becomes the opposite of like, do I inspire you or piss you off? It's like, are you making fun of me or are you enjoying what I'm doing? Like, it's really tricky because like you become a caricature or like, you know, something just like, you know, someone's never seen before and they like post you online or like make, you know, they want to send to their friends who think like you're funny. And that feels really weird as well to feel like you're always kind of being watched or always being like judged more aggressively than just someone who wears khakis. Like, it's really... You know, and, and I can take it, but sometimes you just get really frustrated because, like, you just want to have fun and not feel like you're being watched or feel like you're being judged everywhere you go, even though it's it shouldn't be like that in a city. Like, in a small town, I get it. But this is the city of Denver. Like, we're we're here to have fun. So, like, I don't know. There, there's, there's a lot of, you know, contradicting feelings there that really created a monster. Hello, listener. Thank you so much for hitting play. It's such a privilege to host this podcast and bring it to your ears. And if you're enjoying the show, we would be forever grateful if you'd head over to Apple Podcast, subscribe, download, and give us a review. It goes a long way to help us ensure we can reach more people and empower the LGBTQ plus community to build the relationships we want. As you're talking, the one thing that the image that I get is this little kiddo who's like searching the house for his dolls and like, (laughs) you know, that like this hunt for love and this hunt for some one, some place to really respect his authenticity has become like this echo. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, you know, I... When I told my dad I was gay, he's like, what kind of face is this? And he didn't believe me. I told my mom I was gay because she found my weed. And I was like, yeah, I'm also gay. Let's just get all the bad shit out of the way. Like, I smoke weed. I'm gay. And she just, like, she just, like, knew it. And then the first thing she said to me was, don't get AIDS. And so, in my mind, it was like, I'm either going to, you know, be gay and get AIDS. So that made me really weird for a long time. 
And so, you know, these people instill these like traumas or triggers or all these things about like the stigma of being gay in you. And so I guess that's like, you always know you're going to be uh, like in a battle. Like my mom was like, I just want you to get hurt. I don't want you to do this. Like there's always like that kind of like fight anyways for acceptance. And then to even find love, it's like, that's even trickier. Like, you know, your parents don't accept you in your natural form. So I think you already have a, a, a hill to climb there for me, especially because like, even if I send my mom a picture of me in drag, she's like, I have such a handsome son. And I'm like, you know, that's not the answer that I want. Like, you know, but again, it's like, I can't force you to feel any kind of way that you don't or see any differently. And like, when I did date someone for like four years, my dad would never ask me about them ever. And the day that we broke up, he called me to be like, oh, isn't today just like a great day? Like, isn't like, it, and like, said some bullshit. And I was like, you know that I'm hurting, that I'm miserable, and that like, I just went through a terrible breakup. And you won't even acknowledge it or kind of like comfort me in that because it's not what you believe. So there's a lot of like, even in my happiness, the people I care the most about are not happy. So like, you can't even find happiness because your happiness doesn't bring anyone else happiness. And so like, it's really, really tricky because no matter like you don't want to disappoint your parents so there's always that like at the end of the day it's like how do you ever find safe space or happiness and like you know whatever if you're just disappointing the people who you know what i mean there's, there's such trigger there like in that regard so yeah it's like you you know i i i i that's probably why i push myself to be so authentic i guess because it's like there's so many people who don't even see you as genuine and don't even, you know what I mean? And even in their own genuineness, they're hiding so many things. Like that's why Catholics freak me out and religious people freak me out because you may say one thing, but you act a totally different way and you may preach something, but you don't actually exercise that in your actually day to day. Just because you can read it and recite it does not mean that it's a sense of like, you know, who you look, doesn't mean that's who you are. And that's what I really kind of hate people who can quote something, but then not exercise it. Like it's really painful to me. So that's kind of one of those things where it's just like, I have to be true to me because I've been let down by so many people. So it's like, who else is going to be there for you? Like, how is this going to be like, you know? Yeah, I just, even to this day, I still hope that those dolls are somewhere in my house. Like, it was like never left my mind. Like, well, I looked at my dad's truck. I looked like in my mom's car, looked in the highest cupboards. I would like look in, it was one of those things like, probably why I have such like fear of like losing things now because like something got taken away from me that like I loved. Like yeah. I had like Hollywood hair Barbie and Malibu Barbie and this one Barbie that smelled so good. And even to this day, I'm like, what was that perfume that she wore? I'm like, every now and then I'll smell it and be like, oh, yeah. And it just, you know, and it was, and it didn't, you know, and she, she took them away because I was being made fun of at school for them. And like, I'd bring them to school for like show and tell her, I have a doll. And it was safety that she did it for to protect me from bullies because I was being hurt, but she also like, wouldn't let me be my true self. So like, you know, it was looking at it now I can see it. One thing that I um, see a lot of as a clinician is this content, right? All of these kind of ghosts, if you will, or all of these memories, these triggers, these emotions that when a person gets sober, all of that, starts to bubble up to the surface even without alcohol because now it's not there to mask it or medicate it yeah i mean i guess i i had to get sober to let all that go like literally like i had to i had to give a context that wasn't manic like because getting drunk and having those episodes like there were episodes like i'd get wasted and have like manic episodes of just like defeat and sadness and like not knowing why I wasn't loved or who didn't care about me, but then I realized the way I was acting was probably the reason people didn't love me or care about me or like, you know, have an opinion of me that there is like so much of that where it's like, you know, you have to, you have to give people the time now in the space to like, let them forgive you in their own time. And that's what I'm in right now where it's like, I have to understand that I was that person for a long time. And so you really do try to like, you know, making amends, that's why it's kind of down the list because you have to get through a lot more before you can just like make amends with people. You see some people that like serial date and you get jealous of them. So you want to like shit on them every time you can because you're so miserable. So like, you know, there's certain things I'd say to people and I, I realize all those character flaws and there, there, there's, you know, it all comes to you and like you want to tell everyone that you're sorry or, you know, that you're sober and you want to like boast about it or say these things, but until you really have it under control and like know where it all came from to tell them why you're sorry and like be that vulnerable with someone and be honest and like be ready for them to be like, I still don't care. You're a fucking asshole. Like what you said still stands despite your apology. And despite that, it's like, 
I know that my action spoke so much louder than an apology can because I cut them as deep as I possibly could. Like, and that is what kind of is what I'm dealing with right now is like realizing in my heart how bad I hurt other people at the same time. So like, that's what's kind of interesting about it is like knowing you don't get to like, just make yourself over, even though you're doing something so personal to yourself. Um, so that's, that's what's kind of intense is like those things bubble up because you realize that you were flawed, but like it, it goes back to those Barbies missing and your family not accepting you. And like, it goes back to all those things. And, you know, you see other people's happiness and you get so mad. You just get so mad because you don't have that. And you don't know if they're happy or not. Like, you don't know if it's just the front they have. Like, you don't know if they're a serial dater and that's why they always have a boyfriend because they can't be alone. Like, you know what I mean? There's so much there. And, you know, getting sober, you can like really reflect on who you were and like how much you, you know, hurt people. And you're, you were damaged yourself. So it's just like total vice versa versa vice situation. So there's, you know, so that's kind of what it is. And I, I'm in the place now where I'm just sitting on a lot of it and realizing a lot of it and having to journal to like kind of figure it out and do inventories and do things that are like gut-wrenchingly terrible because, you know, you're not, I'm not trying to place blame. I'm not blaming anyone for anything right now. That's been the most, you know, enlightening part of it is like not placing blame and like sitting with guilt and sitting in these things and not escaping it and not being triggered by it and lashing out, but like really sitting with it being like, you know, I did hurtful things or like, you know, I was, I represented myself in a way that I'm disappointed in now and just recovering from that is like probably like the hardest part because, you know, people have stories about me that I've never met that mm -hmm. met me in ways that I would never want to have met me, you know? So it's just interesting to think about when you think about it. It sounds like you, <laughs> yeah. No, there's a lot of emotion here for you. And it seems as I'm watching you and the tears well up, it almost seems like you really care about those people. Yeah, like, you know, and it's it's weird to be in quarantine and, you know, not be able to reach out to certain people, not be able to like, you know, I want to tell people, the, the, you know, sobriety and this and that, but it's like there's still time that needs to go by and things need to heal or like, you know, until they see me in action and I can put my work, you know, my actions where my mouth is or my whatever mm -hmm. um, money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I just, I have to understand that. Like, I can't just demand their forgiveness and they, you know, it's one of those things you have to see. And it's one of those things. It just, it just takes time. It's crazy. I have some of my own drunk memories where I wake up and, uh, I see text messages or I walk out to the driveway and the driver's side of my car is scraped up and the tire is sideways and I have no idea what I hit. And I think it's so, I want to use this word on purpose, but it's traumatizing to know that you can put yourself in so much harm and not even know what you did. And I think it's traumatizing to, to say, I can't trust myself to keep myself safe. And I think addiction has just such a strong hold. Yeah. And, you know, you wake up, you take people home and you do, you, you just do risky behaviors. You do these things. Like one time my friend lended me her car and I couldn't even like stay sober enough to not drive the car home drunk. And I like woke up in a tezzy, had no idea where I put it. And I was like parked in front of my house. And I didn't know if like... I had hit someone or scraped something or like when I parallel parked, I hit someone's bumper, but like I have a big memory, but like I couldn't even keep myself sober for like a week to like, you know, be grateful to do that and have a car. And like, you know what I mean? And I, and I tried and I was like, I'm going to the bar and have a couple of drinks. Well, like I know the bartender, the drinks are really strong. I'm going to get fucked up. And I, that's all I could do is like, I just wanted so badly to escape and get drunk that like, I couldn't even not do it for these like luxuries that I had because I, I, I don't drive so the car was a luxury and I couldn't even like take care of it or like, you know, do those things. And I never got a car because I couldn't, I, I knew I would drive it drunk. Like that sounds terrible, but like I was really afraid of getting a DUI and ruining my life. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a car for years because I drinking was more important. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that you're like, look at it now and you're like, that's crazy. But it was also like protecting of myself. Like it, it wasn't going to, I knew that that would, could be a life ruiner. And so I wouldn't even put myself in that position because drinking was more important. Mm. Like it, it's crazy, but like, you know, 
I have it written down in my journal. Like, I'm not going to get a car because I don't want to get DUI. I don't want to get, I don't want to like, I, I knew that I would be a harm to everyone and everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the drinking was more important. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, you, you wake up sometimes and you're like, did I have sex with that person? One of my friends, I can't believe you like, I had sex last night. And I was like, I didn't have sex with anyone. And they're like, yeah, you did. And then you're like, what's, well, did anyone get raped? Like, you have to, you have these thoughts and you have these feelings. And it's, it's, it's really, really such a gray area. <laughs> Even though you black out drunk, but mm-hmm. you know, there's such shame and you're like, I'll never do that again. I'll never do it again. Next weekend you do it again. But like when all you want to do is get drunk and escape and leave, you know, the pain of shit behind you and the misery of whatever it is that you're doing. Like that's why alcohol is so powerful because it's so common to use it for those purposes. Like it's, it's such a drug. It's so toxic where it's like, you're not escaping anything. You're only making everything more complicated. You're only making everything more problematic. Like alcohol is, is not an escape. It's not a getaway. It's so the opposite. It causes so much affliction. It is insane now being sober to like realize how it, it really holds people down. How long have you been sober? How many days? Um, I think it's been almost five months now wow. like yeah like it'll be five months in like, like two like a couple of weeks i think or yeah five five months five months and um yeah i mean it is it is a wild amount of clarity and i do go to aa and i do reach out to people and i have a sponsor and you know i'm doing all the things i should and you know i'm going really slow because it's something that i really really want so now that you know i have this sobriety thing under you know under wraps to some degree it's still you know, I feel really, really blessed because I, I say blessed, it's bullshit. I'm not blessed, but, um, I, I don't crave alcohol in, in a way that's like, like, a, like addicted. Like I'm not, I, when I was ready to quit, I was ready to quit. And I, but I know as soon as I drink once I'll binge drink. That's my advice. I binge drink. I drink so much in small settings. I like, I'm an aggressive drinker. And like, I know as soon as I have one shot, I won't have the energy or the uh, power to be sober again. Like I'm kind of like a one and done, you know, like I feel like it would be that like, it's really, it's in that way where like, this is cold Turkey. This is really, really hard. I probably can start crying, (sighs) but like, I know that. So like, this is like my, my, my only chance to like really do this. And there's like so much pressure on it. Cause it's, it's, you know, I'm like, am I never going to have champagne on my birthday again? Like, and it's like, no, I'm never going to have champagne on my birthday again. Mm-hmm. Like, alcohol is not there for me anymore. Like, when I call her, she's not there. Like, that person is dead. Like, that that thing is gone out of my life now. And it's like, you you mourn it. Like, you like you miss it. <laughs> it's not so dumb. I agree. Oh, my God. But it is, it's, that's like a real process is realizing that, like, you grieve the loss of alcohol. And you're like, who does that? Who is that? Like, why? But you you go through that emotion and like you realize it's gone and you have to like accept it and be like it's gone and like but that also gone with it is that person who you never want to be and you never want to see again you never want to do that so it's like you know as much as I don't crave it I know I can't have it like I don't even know if I tell myself I don't crave it I don't I don't you know what I mean that's the hard thing I don't I, I know that I'm not physically like I need this and I know that I can't do it ever again like or else I'll, you know, and it's, it's such a burden to think that it's a forever thing, mm-hmm. but like it is mm-hmm. like, and I know that like, and it's just, it's hard. And like, you know, I didn't, and it's hard because going into AA, it's like, I want to be sober from alcohol, but like, I still might want to do drugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my sponsor is like, you can't do that. And I'm like, but I'm going to like, I still think I may want to drop acid or do mushrooms or like, you know, I don't know if that's wrong of me to say, but that's the hard thing too, to be like, do I want to be sober, sober forever? Or do you know? It, it, you don't want to disappoint those people who take it that seriously because they need to. I, it's it's a gray area. It's mm-hmm. a really really gray spot for me right now. Where it's just like I gave up alcohol. That's what I, you know. And I, and I think that I have the the head on my shoulders to know that if I were to start doing something else and realizing it was affecting my life and the way that alcohol is, I would stop. Sure. Sure. But you never know because mm-hmm. just because just not being able to escape and not having a vice is is you know it's it's crazy. It's, it's intense. It's really really intense to be like I am of sober mind like i'm of sober person like the thing that stands out for me is alcohol is such a cultural um mortar it's the glue in many situations that holds us together and i'm gonna go out on a limb here but 
in a context where you're craving to feel connected and loved and a part of something with someone, getting rid of alcohol is another loss of some dolls. Right. It's another, I don't belong. Right. And, and that's, and that's the thing is I, you know, I thrive in nightlife. I thrive going out. I'm like a people person. I love to party. I love to dance. I create a party wherever I go. I inspire people wherever I go until I become that blacked out person who just irritates people. You know, one of my friends was like, you're a liability. <laughs> and I truly was like, I believe that. Like, cause the thing is, is I, when I, when I, when I approach a room or, you know, going somewhere, it's like so much energy in life in, in you know, in this person and so it's like I attract a lot of people and everyone thinks that I'm great until I become Jekyll and Hyde. Like that really, you know, that 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 it switches and I become like a drunk and, a, you know, the, that person. And honestly, it's like I don't ever want to do that again. And, and that's why it's so easy because I do thrive in social settings until I become a bad person. And so when I walk into room, I still have that same kinetic energy with a lot of people. And so it's like they need that lube. And now that I now that they have it, it's like, you know, they become more fun and vibrant, but I had to tell certain bartenders, I was like, I'm not drinking anymore, but I can't leave the nightlife. Like I can't leave my community, queer people. That's what we do. That's where we are. That's how like where, you know, and, and that's one of those things. It's like, you know, you have to be stronger than the alcohol and the peer pressure and those things where it's like, no one truthfully cares that you don't drink. They start, you know, judging themselves more because you're not drinking. So they like project this on themselves of like, well, you're not drinking. Like, fuck you. Like, I'm doing a shot. You're fucking crazy. Then, you know, mm-hmm. you're driving them home because they're too fucked up to walk. And right. you're like, am I crazy? Am I, you know, again, it's not righteous by any means, but like you start to realize like why people do it or what, what their vices are, you know, and certain things you just kind of, you become, you know, it doesn't become irritating. It becomes like sad to watch. It becomes weird to watch people struggle and suffer. And like, you know, they get drunk and they want to dance and like that's what it really takes you to be wasted to dance like that's what also complicated and that's even when i was sober it was still that like even when i was wasted i mean i it was still that like i was so comfortable dancing then people weren't until they were wasted so it was like i had to you know i had to it was a long game for me to finally get them wasted enough to like dance or be themselves or see their true selves like people have it in them obviously it's who they are but <laughs> they don't show it until they are lubricated and wasted and feel that kind of way so you know it's 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 it is bizarre to know that like when you go to a party like you have to play beer pong with water or you have to like kind of hide the fact that you're not drinking like i'll bring my own bottle places so it's not socially awkward but like i have like a bigger brown beer bottle i'll bring fill with water i'll bring you know some like a lemonade in like a container to when i when i know i'm going some people are going to be drinking but like it's a game to blend in to not even call attention to it because i try not to like be like i don't drink like well like it's too nerve-wracking because you don't want people to put pressure on you to be like that's stupid because then you feel vulnerable and dumb and then you have to be prepared because you know like you don't even want to drink so you just be ready to not Mm -hmm. you know like it's 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 a delicate delicate balance to really kind of like not be not be triggered by other people's wastedness because they can't be themselves but then also not be like righteous because you're sober Mm -hmm. in a way where you have to understand people are going to be goofy and dumb and like it's just, you know, they're, they're going to try to be themselves. They're going to try to get there. And so you have to, like, be patient with them in a weird way. What are some of your favorite AA mantras? Oh, God. Um, G-O-D, group of drunks, mm-hmm. which I really love. Um, we, uh, it, I love um, progress, not perfection. Mm-hmm. That's, like, very, very crucial to, like, my existence right now. Is like, you know, you're just building towards a better person. Like, there's no such thing as perfect. Like, you know, there's kind of nothing really there for that and um oh i wrote down one yesterday but i don't remember what it is now but yeah i guess i just again there's something about community there though it's not even the mantras it's the fact that you can go into a room of so many like minded people from every walk of life from every kind of situation from every financial background from every you know career possible and all of them, we all realize that alcoholism is a disease. Like it affects us greater than something, you know, it, that, that we, we can't control. Like it's, you know, it's worse than a virus. It's worse than anything. It's like this socially acceptable way 
to harm yourself on a daily basis. It's this thing you can go and buy and poison yourself with that you are powerless against. Like, so when you go to a space where you can be like, I am powerless against this. And people are like, yep. Like, so Mm -hmm. like, it just, it's that kind of thing. And it's like, it's not, it's like, it's group therapy. It's the idea that like, you do have to struggle with this. Like you do struggle with it. Like I'm struggling with it. Like it's very that and it's honesty. And it's people who, you know, you have to sit with and really realize you're like, you know, they have everything I want. They have a nice car. They have a beautiful house. They have children, they have people, but they're powerless against alcohol. And that's kind of, and you're like, yeah, like that's right. Like they, you know, and everyone has their different stories with it. And, you know, people don't realize that they're an alcoholic until so late in life. And I'm a little bit younger right now realizing it. And I'm like, if I don't have to go through these ebbs and flows and these traumas and these experiences, one of the mantras is, is called the Yetis. Like, I haven't gotten, you know, my kid's taken away yet. I haven't gotten a DUI yet. I haven't, like, punched a cop yet. Like, I haven't, you know, domestic violence yet. Like, it's all those things that alcoholics all know are going to happen to them if they keep drinking. Like, it, it's the Yetis. And right now, I don't have those things anymore. Like, I, I'm not afraid that I'm going to get a DUI. I'm not afraid I'm going to, you know, get an assault charge because I was drunk and hit someone. Or they tried to hit me or, like, I stole someone something. Or, like, you know, I don't... That's probably like my favorite is, you know, the Yetis and, mm-hmm. and the progress, not perfection, because you really have to work on yourself every day. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. What's, what's your type of man? Oh, God. I want a, probably like a stocky ginger bearded mm-hmm. dude who like every now and then puts on a fake lash and like might have a gown in his mm-hmm. closet. Nice. <laughs> That's really what mm-hmm. really want. So, yeah. What's the favorite? What um, is your favorite Instagram account to follow? Oh gosh, um, probably, um, um, oh God, Van Herpen, what is her first name? I just wrote Van Herpen, she's a fashion designer, it's literally incredible, it's, she manipulates fabric in a way that no one ever has, she laser cuts things, it is like cutting edge of what fashion is, and like the capabilities of fabric and textile and like body armor. Nice. Yeah. Favorite meal? Oh God. Um, I really love like broccoli and cheese stuffed chicken. Mm, it's like one of my favorites. Yes. <laughs> mm. One last thing. Yes. Two sentences, maybe three. If you could go back and tell who that little boy who's looking for his dolls, one thing, what would you tell him? You can always make your own. <laughs> like, you know, you gotta like you gotta, you gotta get creative. You gotta you gotta get what you want. You can you can make your own. Um, it's just be resourceful, really. It's, it's what it is. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Shame will shut down the spontaneity of our personalities. As I reflect on my time with today's guest, I can't shake the image of a precious little boy who found joy in playing with dolls one who wanted to be loved for the innocence he found within himself, hoping others would cherish his innocence as much as he did. I know all too well what it feels like to be in his position. I cannot tell you the amount of times I've been called a maricon, which means a faggot in Spanish, or teased by loved ones for being different, feminine, or creative. And when family members mock or derogate our genuine expression, it feels like they're also revoking our sense of being unconditionally loved. And what a painful experience to live through. The pain of losing such a precious facet of life like undeniable love can leave us hunting for an emotional home. Feeling unworthy, many of us will approach relationships with apprehension. I've realized in my own relationship with pain that it can be so deep and so sneaky, it becomes a narrative and a posture with which I approach relationships. Am I really worth it? isn't a thought we think anymore consciously, but a feeling we carry everywhere we go, even into relationships. With such a harbored pain tucked into the fabric of our identities, we will require a medication and alcohol works really well for many of us. It helps us let loose. It's there when we celebrate. It's there to welcome us to the dance floor. We might very well have no conscious idea we are using a substance or a pattern to mask over a wound, but we are. The medication we choose to relieve our pain will often start to work against us. We use the medication to soothe our shame, but often that leads us to more shame, more regret, and more embarrassment. 
And so we need more medication to soothe the larger dose of shame and so forth and so on. And eventually we find ourselves in a never ending cycle, maybe even an addiction. Hurt people hurt people. And as the guest said it, vice versa, versa vice. But when we step into the courage and maintain sobriety from any of our medications, our pain is still waiting to be soothed and healed once and for all. Sobriety may be the first time many of us address the pain that lurks in the hidden and buried corners of our hearts. But what strikes me so profoundly about our guest is his tenacity for authenticity, his moral compass that's always pointing back towards undeniable acceptance. In sobriety, we reconcile our identities, not only by making amends with others, but by wrestling with the pain that had sung its tune until we forge a sense of confidence seeing our worth and lovability, maybe even for the first time. I hope that all of us strike upon that internal gold our guest articulated so beautifully. May we all walk in the confidence to love ourselves so deeply that others are liberated to experience self-love within themselves. Thanks for tuning in. Queer Relation Tips is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I am Clinic. Create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic.